just wondered if you were able to give us a wee bit of a kind of rundown or a resume of um, how you were able to respond to COVID, particularly in the early stages of, of the pandemic. Well, as I said, Quality and Community Centre ran as a community centre where we had activities seven days a week. So when we found out that um, there was going to be a lockdown, I um, made a suggestion to the board that we could not shut down Quality and Community Centre because we're in a deprivation area. I mean, child poverty was 38% pre-COVID. It's now way up at 70%. So the board agreed that I could repurpose <coughs> into a community anchor organisation, COVID, and we started really posting on Facebook the various things that we would do to help. <coughs> and um, the funding officer from the National Lottery actually phoned me. My manager's post is funded through the lottery. And he said, Rose, I'm quite amazed some of the things that you've been doing in the last week. He says, put an, an application in for awards for all for 10,000 and we'll have a decision within two weeks. I put the application in on the Monday night phoned me on the Tuesday morning and says, Rose, we're just going to give you 12 and it'll be in your bank on Friday. You do what you want to do. So that, that was just amazing. I was able to then turn our community calf into a small mini call centre and we put in new lines in, additional lines to what we had. And it was really, we were busy seven days a week. We had over 100 volunteers coming through wanting to help. But when, you know, government tried to say, look, we want as many people to stay home safe, we lost a lot of our volunteers. Um, so we had a cohort of volunteers that worked literally from nine to five on a daily basis. And from there, um, I just applied for any amounts of funding that was going. And I was fortunate to get 60,000 from Support and Communities Fund. So that was all, <coughs> excuse me, all the projects um, that we were doing digital connectivity, befriending, and things just um, snowballed from there. At one time, the centre was covering not just North Glenrothes, where we've got 19,000 residents, it was actually covering some parts of Fife. We were putting food parcels out into Dunfermline, down to Leaven, down to Kirkcaldy. Um, it was, I think, two or three months before other organisations started hitting the ground running as well. As I said, at one time, we were really um, running. I was also able to disperse funds. I got £18,000 from Sport and Communities Fund. They wanted us to be kind of intelligence gathering where we could then find out all the different organisations that were out there to help. And I was able to disperse funds, especially for those organisations that had to stay at home, couldn't see their clients or service users. Um, so we gave them laptops, we gave them phones, everything like that, so they can start in their service, especially for those with mental health. Because right from day one, their community psychiatric nurses didn't go to see them, you know, all the, the, the help was withdrawn. So we really just went on from strength to strength. Lots of residents, lots of local companies gave me money, um, donated money for us to do various things. So I um, have a list of things that we did right from digital connectivity where we got elderly people and vulnerable people who had never been connected to the web before and we got them online and we were able to do um, FaceTime grandchildren and things like that. We also did a lot of health and well-being, encouraged people to stay in their gardens, we did a growing together project, anything really to keep them safe but to keep their mind because right from day one you know mental health really kicked in. In fact, it's kicked in even worse, I find, from the, the second lockdown from when we first had the lockdown. Um, so I had to bring on a new member of staff. We, we were literally working seven days a week. We've put out over 5,000 food parcels. We're now trying to do batch cooking because it's all very well supporting these people, but they can't be reliant. We have to try wean them off and encourage them. Um, to cook better, you know, to cook in a budget. So we're doing everything like that. The government, I've been very fortunate with government funding and one of a good initiative they gave me was community champions. They gave me funding for four months for community champions. We found that even though Collardine was a very vibrant centre prior to COVID, there was a lot of people who didn't come to the centre. And I found that 
special people, they were online, they could see everything that we were offering. But there was a lot of people living who were isolated, alone, didn't know what was going on. So the community champions um, worked within the community and interacted with these people, taking food to them, leaving it on their doorstep and things like that. Um, so it's, I would say that community resilience and everything, not just for Collagen, has been great. I mean, we've all really all pulled together. Um, we've been fortunate, I've had I think, six awards for the work that the centre has done with the volunteers, which is great. You know, it's a small award, but it, it, it does wonders um, for our staff and volunteers. And as I said earlier, who would have thought February 2021 would be still here from March last yeah. year? Um, I still have quite a fair bit of funding that I'm working on. I was fortunate when I got some, um, I've not had them yet, the devices from Connecting Scotland, because as much as, you know, a lot of the parents, you know, it, it shared with me that they didn't do homeschooling. Um, they felt they didn't have the skills to do it. They were tired. Um, when, you know, all of a sudden, when you've got three children at home, the husband's home, you've not got a job or you're furloughed, you know, funds are low, yeah. you start fighting and arguing, things like that. Um, so we started, I started a family fun session on a Tuesday, we would help people with their homeschooling. And okay, as I says to the mums and dads, if you don't follow the school curriculum, just bake with them, play a game with them, play dance with them, it's all learning, you know? So really when we approached the, the mums and dads like that, it was a lot better. Yeah. I've been fortunate as well um, where when the set, when the lockdown happened, you know, at Christmas, when they, they said that everyone had to stay home, we we're faced with a lot of problems, not just in our area, I would imagine it's all over Scotland. Youngsters are still going in groups. They won't be told, you know. So we're allowed to put our detached workers out. We can't involve in activities, but we can say to them, look, please get home. But then you would still have the odd youngster who would start crying and take your confidence and say I'm safer outside than I am at home and that itself was something completely different you know yeah. I've helped CASP and Five Women's Aid um, and their numbers have risen. CASP when I burst out crying about three months ago when I spoke to the director she's taken on two members of staff now what did that tell you? Two new members yeah. of staff so the increase of um, children being um, abused um, was on the rise. It, it was quite sad. I think a lot of our organisations, I'm not saying they don't understand, but there's a lot of people don't realise implications of what's happened and the ramifications will be, it will be years and years before, you know, especially young people who were safe at school and then all of a sudden were locked down with, a, a, you know, their father or an uncle or a brother, you know, it, it, it was very, very difficult. And as I said, we're, go we're going to have lots of problems. Youngsters not having homeschool and youngsters not being at school, lots of different things that's going to affect them, you know, in months mm -hmm. and years to come. So I do think all the organisations have to come together. Um, I did yeah. say at Five Council, you know, I've been fortunate to be quite a front runner for doing things. I want to be involved in executive decisions. I don't want you sitting in your ivory tower, you know, making decisions. You have to listen to your grassroots organisations yeah. who have been at the coal phase that know the problems. Can I ask a wee bit more about that, Rosamond? I think that's the, that's a really comprehensive account of, what, of how you've responded. And I think I um, just want to, want to build on what you were saying there about working with others to achieve the change that's required, because that's at the heart of co-production, I feel like, about combining mutual strengths and capacities so um, that you can work with one another on an equal basis to achieve change. So can you say a little bit more about that kind of approach that you've taken in terms of working with Life Council, other organisations, uh, local? In all my kind of like 40 years, in all my, for, excuse me. Right, I'll stop. The lights go off automatically when you don't move for a while. Um, in all my years of management, I, I'm a great advocate of partnership working. I think it's important. Um, so not only have I um, enhanced existing relationships, working relationships, I've forged a lot of more partnerships, which what's the use, you know, of um, reinventing the wheel or duplicating services when you have skilled staff there? You have to share. Gone is this myth, you know, people 
don't want to share because they think, oh, you're taking away a job from us or you'll, you know, we can't look like that. These people need as many services working together as possible. And even, um, I know that the government, because um, I had a politician came and visited the centre, said that the, the government agreed that we're going to bring people, released, release them early from prisons. Um, but nobody put in any infrastructure. So when they came from a prison, they're putting a scatter flat in Collidine with not even a kettle. What does the person do? Goes and steals a kettle yeah. back inside. So I think now they've decided there's going to be a lot more joined up work and we have okay. to, um, you know, listen to each other, learn from our strengths and draw something. To, we, we cannot go forward in isolation of each other. We have to say, look, we can bring this to the table. You can bring that to the table. How is it going to be, you know, to help for the health and well-being of going forward? Mm -hmm. that's, that's really useful. Can you give us a, maybe a couple of examples of some of the challenges you've faced in trying to work with others, but also a couple of examples of what's worked well um, over the past few months? Um, I think it's fair to say, Dave, that I've not had any challenges with working in partnership. I think um, I used to have um, some difficulties prior to COVID, you know, I think people maybe thought I was too outspoken and thought, oh, no, we don't want to listen to you. But I think now in COVID, when they realise that we are doing things, we're doing things well, they are listening. And I say to them, look, I'm not here looking at wanting to get your job or anything like that. You've got skills in areas I don't have. We have to bring all these skills, which is better for our end user. Um, so I don't think I've had any really challenges. Um, just challenges where maybe people have come out of um, Stratedon or they've come in um, from in prison and maybe the, there wasn't joined up services there. But I think we've learned from um, things that we've done wrong and um, we're hoping we moving forward. I'm involved in a lot more community groups now um, mm -hmm. than before. And I think we have to show we're not in competition with each other. And, and I do understand, you know, I third sector is going to be a lot of third sector organisations are not going to make it. The funding's not going to be there, you know. So I think, OK, well, maybe two or three third sector organisations have to co come together collectively, then put in a bid for funding. We have to show joined up working because um, you can't put a price on skills. You know, each person will have different skills. Yeah. Sorry, I want to say so I think that's really important. That it's not just about uh, joined up working between sectors, but it's within the sector as well, the need for community organisations to work together. Yes. Um, somebody mentioned to me in another chat I had with them, there's been an, uh, some, somebody said there's been an outbreak of cooperation in our community since the, since the start of the pandemic. I thought that summed it up quite well because of the, the need yes. uh, that's there. Okay. Just kind of kind of building on that as well and looking ahead um, more as well. You did say earlier that you just thought we'd still be in, in this kind of situation in February 21. But what would you say are the key areas of learning from COVID that need to inform how yourselves and other agencies, projects and community groups work together in the future? So what's the kind of the key areas of learning for you? I do think there'll be a lot people will still continue to Zoom and do Teams. Personally, I, I'm not a Zoomer or a Teamer. You know, I'm a kind yeah. of chalk and talk person. But just only in the last week, we I do Digital Youth Club on a, on a Wednesday for seniors. And with, after speaking to the mothers and some of the, the young people, um, especially I've got a couple of people who are autistic, they don't want to come in to a youth club when it opens. They want to continue doing digital. They're safe in their own space, in their home. You know, they don't want to be in crowds, they don't want to be in noise, they're quite happy, it's this way of moving forward. So there's different, I think, I'm learning different way, learning tools of, of how to engage, looking at different ways I would never have thought before, and, and listening to the people. We have to, I mean, for the last year, we have done everything we possibly can, but we have to empower people. We cannot continue to help them, they have to be able to help themselves, you know, especially those who unfortunately and sadly rely on food parcels and food bank. We have to try and move away from that. It won't happen overnight, 
um, but we have to empower people. Um, so that is something on, on my, that I do take to the board, that we have yeah. to start doing this, you know, um, do you, and do you, the boards are yeah. behind me. That's good. Do you find that there's been a shift in the attitude and the practice of agencies, though, along those same lines, in agencies who may have been used to delivering services to people? Definitely, because, as I said, um, we've got capital works that's going on at the moment, and one of my um, business ideas was, I've heard of so many organisations just not re renewing their lease on property, they're wanting to work from home. Now, okay, personally, I couldn't work from home. It would do whatever to my mental health. I need to be out and about. But if people are going to work from home, they have to come out maybe every fortnight or every month. And I'm offering business services for companies to come and use our building and everything like that. Because um, I think it'll be a long time before I can get yoga or Tai Chi back, you know, for somebody to come because it won't make money. I have to look at different ways I can capitalise on things that we're doing a lot more with um, our doctors and our um, local chemists. Um, they're going to come out and offer um, a, an afternoon, you know, um, yeah. so they're coming into, into the community. I think I had heard, in fact, one of my funding was that um, the Scottish government, the same as English, doesn't want somebody to have to walk more than 20 minutes. Um, within a neighbourhood to access um, services where we have that at the moment. You know, you've got elderly people maybe need two buses yeah. or a, a single person with two children, you know. So I'm looking at different ways. I've never run College as a conventional community centre and I certainly, moving forward, won't. I will, you know, I'm looking maybe to have small social enterprises, just looking at different ways how we can engage with these young people who are going to suffer um, and they're going to find it difficult when I mean, government or not even government people say, oh yeah, these youngsters will get a job. And no, employers, I feel, will just go right over them, you know, if somebody doesn't have um, qualifications. So I'm hoping maybe to make sure we're giving them life skills, soft skills, all these type of things an employer would look for. I'm just looking at different ways. Um, we used to have a job club here on a Tuesday morning. Um, when we're back running, I'm going to have one at night. Why can't people who work through the day not get the opportunity to access job club services to be able to move in off a um, zero-hour contract or move to part-time? So it's opened my eyes of how different ways um, for me to, to offer a service that I probably wouldn't have thought about before. That's really useful. No, thank, thanks for that, Rose. And that's, that's all my kind of set questions, I think, but is there anything else? That you want to kind of see? No, I would just like um, to kind of thank you. Um, I had written, uh, a politician who would remain nameless had asked me, you know, how did I think of taking Collagen forward? And my last kind of paragraph was, that I'm hoping that I could play a part in tackling the prevailing economic and social regeneration challenges that we are going to be facing. Personally, my focus is going to be on supporting places tackling poverty and inequality with the ultimate goal of, goal of enhancing collective wellbeing. That is my kind of strap line and that's what I'm bringing my staff and volunteers. Yeah. 